Here's exclusive footage of a film now being made about an abandoned boy who became a doctor. advice on courses to take, and here I was, num number one student. He looked at me and said, I'm putting you in woodshop where you belong. But I stood up and said, I really want to go to college. He said, fine, I will put you in college prep courses, but I can guarantee you're going to fail. He's so inspirational. I want to be just like him. <laughs> and he's a pediatrician, and that's the career I want to go into. And knowing that he did it and all the struggles he went through, it motivates me. And I'm like, I can do it. I heard his story for the first time in middle school when he came to speak at my middle school. And I was really inspired. He'd been my doctor my whole life, and I had no idea. He had such an amazing story. And then he made me also want to, after I complete my, the career goal I want to get, which is orthopedic surgery, I want to come back to the community just like he did. Mark? An abandoned boy who grew up working his whole childhood in the fields to support himself and contribute to the household became a physician and went back to the same area he grew up in and has been treating kids there for 30 years. That's an important story. A story that you're changed and your opinion is changed and your even self-image is changed when you walk away. Now you've seen a movie. Now you've been to the movies. everyone, thanks for having us. Um, I thought I'd begin today by reading a quote about you, Dr. Ressa, that was written by author and speaker Jim Cathcart. Ramon's story is the story of human potential, the unique personal potential that exists within us, independently from any external source. We are not limited by our age, our health, our relationships, or our finances, nearly as much as by our own unwillingness to dream and persist. Ramon, you are a unique and gifted individual with an important place in history. Your legacy will be felt for many generations, maybe even forever. So Jim Cathcart obviously gets your story, and so do we, the filmmakers. And I think the gist of, of what really gets to us is that it really does show the almost unlimited potential of every human being and of the average person. So I think we can all relate to that and I think it's incredibly important and inspiring and that's why we're making the movie about your story. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, well let's start by talking about your family because your story is incredible and um, it begins with your family. So um, you didn't know who your father was and you were given away by your mother. Um, tell us a little bit about your sense of family or how you considered family to be in your life. Well, my mother had five kids before she was 21 and she gave us all the way, um, even though we all had the same father. And to this day, I still don't know who my father is. She died a couple of years ago um, and before she died, we asked her, who's our father? and she refused to tell us. Even though we, I said she had five kids, I didn't realize I had a couple of siblings because she didn't tell us that either. And I didn't find out about them until I was in my 20s. 
Um, as far as other siblings, I have no idea because I don't know who my father is. But she gave us away to a family of 15. Um, and she told us they were our grandparents, which found out that one of them was a grandparent, but the other one, not sure where he came from. Uh, so they had 15 in that family. And they basically just took us in because they needed more field work, workers to pick the crops. So the more hands we had at that time, the better you did. Um, so that's how I ended up in Goshen, California. So Goshen is a very tiny town. Can you kind of paint a picture of, of what that was like for you in the, in the 50s when you grew up there? Well, when I grew up in Goshen in the 50s and 60s, it was um, poverty, all farm workers. Um, you, were, you were considered rich if you actually had an indoor job. And we all strived to get an indoor job. That was our goal. If uh, we could get a factory job, we considered that we made it in life. Because we were always told that all we were good for was to, uh, to be farm workers. And um, a step up was getting out of that hot sun, getting out of that cold weather. You know, when you're picking cotton, and it's foggy, and when you're picking oranges, and it's foggy and cold, and the, the, the fruit still has ice on them. When you're picking grapes under the, the grapevines, and it's 105, you're hot and sweaty, and black widows and wasps all over the place. Your goal is to get out <laughs> into, into the environment where it's controlled. Right, so later on in your life, when you wanted to get a summer job and things like that, you wanted an indoor job, right? You, yeah. uh, and you couldn't get one. Yeah, I, I decided to apply as a stock boy at J.C. Penney's. And uh, I went up and I asked, and they said, um, well, you don't have any job experience. You know, here I work 12 hours a day, every summer, every holiday, since the age of three years of age. And I was told I had no job experience to even be a stock boy. Um, of course, in those days, if you were Mexican or minority, they didn't give you those jobs. They saved those jobs for uh, people who had some influence or who knew somebody at the store. And of course, you know, being a farm worker, you don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. Wow. OK. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about your family. Um, so you said you didn't know your father. You never knew him. You didn't know anything about him. Um, what do you think that did to you as a child in, in terms of your developing and growing up? When you don't have a father, you know, it's when I became a father, I wanted to be around for my kids and play with them and show them the world. And growing up, I had nothing of that. All I was told is get out there and work in the wheels. You know, get up at that ladder and pick up oranges, or get under those grapes, and who cares if they're wasps or black widows? That was my role model, work, work, work. There was no fun. I don't remember playing at all as a kid. It was just work. Wow. So when I had, so I, have, I had no concept of how to be a father, so when I had my own kids, I was afraid that of screwing them up the way I was screwed up. So you were afraid, but you always knew at the same time that you wanted to have kids, right? I wanted to have kids because I wanted to, if I ever had kids, I wanted to have them to have a different world that I had and give them the opportunity that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. To be a kid, I mean, really, to be a kid. And uh, you certainly have done that. I mean, your kids um, are the American success story as well. Your son has followed your footsteps. He's a... Well, my son... When, when I graduated from, from junior high, I was the number one student. They called me into the office and said, because of your speech impediment and, and other reasons, we're not going to let you be the valedictorian. We're, let, we're going to let somebody else do that. And I thought, that's great, because I didn't want to get in front of an audience anyway. I hate to be in front of a public. Um, so when my son graduated from junior high, he was the number one student. He became the valedictorian. He graduated top of his class at high, in high school. He graduated and went to Stanford University. He was accepted to UC San Francisco Medical School. And he just finished his residency training in pediatrics at Brown University. And this is despite the fact that he always told me he was never going to be a doctor and follow in my <laughs> footsteps. He, is, he will be actually starting a fellowship in New York at Sloan Kettering next year in pediatric hematology oncology. So, so I hate him because <laughs> life for him was so easy going through school. 
and I suffered so much, and I struggled so much. But when you know, but and you paid for them too. And I and I and one of the things I love to tell people is, I went to I went to college, and I, and grants and scholarships, and working my butt off. I mean, I worked every summer holidays to pay what my parents were supposed to pay. Uh, it's, it's their uh, their side of the uh, of the college expenses. Um, so when my daughter ended up going to college, she went to UC Santa Cruz like my wife and I did, and I was proud to pay for her ex college expenses. And I made the mistake of telling my son that if he got accepted to Harvard or MIT or Stanford, that I would pay his way. He received a full ride at UCLA and Berkeley, but idiot me, I did make that comment <laughs> and that promise, so I was proud to pay for him to attend Stanford University. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that'd be one of your weaknesses. What's that? <laughs> that you, uh, you uh, speak out of hand and get yourself in trouble. <laughs> exactly, I do that all the time, and then I have to pay okay. the price. Um, okay, so one of the things that we're gonna do in the film is, is uh, when some of your problems intersect with societal problems, we're gonna touch on that and talk about that. So one of those issues is hunger. And um, you grew up hungry as a child, and right now there are about 13 million kids in this country who are hungry. So um, I want to know what that's like because I've never been hungry, like really never hungry. And I, I just I want to hear what that was like growing up and how that impacted you. The first time I ever felt that I had enough to eat was my first day in college, the cafeteria. You know, when you would go up there and they'd say, oh, you can have all the food you can eat. I thought, wow. So I loaded up my tray and I got three glasses of chocolate milk because at home we couldn't ever afford to buy chocolate or stuff like that. So I was always in heaven. But when you grow up poor, I mean, in 15 kids in the family, food runs, runs out. You know, I remember being down to our last sack of beans and, um, and working in the winter and when there, there was a freeze a number of times where we could work, so there's no food. and Luckily, you know, people would drop food off at our doorstep, beans and rice and flour for the tortillas, and that's all what we survived on. Um, and now my biggest joy is to do that for other people, to, to buy some beans and rice and flour and give it to food pantries because they feed the people that were like me. And I just just remember being hungry all the time and you know, going out and trying to study and, and work at school and do well educationally. I just was always hungry. It's just never, and here I am picking grapes and picking oranges and picking all this crap, but. Yeah, that. I can't imagine that. You're picking the food that we eat and yet you can't eat it you're, and you're hungry. Yeah, my grandfather was really good at raising animals. We had rabbits and chickens and, and goats and you know, so, so we were able to sustain ourselves on lean times because he always had something. Um, and he was able to get the food for those animals by the leftovers in the fields that we picked. So you live basically on rice and beans and tortillas? Is that your main? Yep, that's why I still love rice and beans and tortillas <laughs> and potatoes. I mean, if somebody asked me, wants me to take, take me to a fancy restaurant, the first thing I look at, look at is, do they have beans or do they have rice or do they have <laughs> tortillas? So I, obviously I love Mexican food because that's my comfort food. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I survived on, so. Okay. Um, great, so as a kid, did you ever imagine you'd be successful? As a kid, I was a farm worker, and I was, was going to be a farm worker. I was, I was told that with my life. So no, I had no clue. I mean, you know, in my family, if you, if you graduate from eighth grade, you're considered intelligent. And so, I mean, to go beyond that and to even think about going to college, and even when I entertained the idea of going to college, people were saying, well, what do you want to waste your time for? Mm -hmm. You know, those are only for smart people, and those are only for white people. You know, we, we don't. You, know, you go out and get a job in the factory. So that's what they thought was considered making it in life. So you thought you could get a factory job? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. Wow, great pay, indoor job, mm -hmm. you know. So did you ever dream about other things though? Like, um, I don't know, things you might see on TV or you might read about, comic books or? No, anything? I mean, because everything you saw on TV back in those days, the sitcoms, I mean, they were all Anglo families around the table with food on the 
table and talking about the events of the day in school and all that stuff. I mean, no, that was, that was not us. I mean, we, uh, we could not identify with that whatsoever. I, I mean, that was so foreign to me that I looked at that, it was just a different world. I mean, we, we didn't exist in that world. In fact, if you look at those movies from those times and those uh, uh, shows, the only time you saw a minority in those shows was as a janitor or a cook or a subservient menial jobs. You didn't see them in, as a teacher or a parent or, I mean, we had no role models whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get that. Um, okay, so let's talk about when you started school. And when you started school, you didn't speak English, and you were told that you could not speak Spanish in school. And now I know that there's a lot of um, English as a second language classes and bilingual education, but in those years, there, there, there was none of that. So I can't imagine how hard that would have been to start school like that. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? Well, in, since I had a lot of older, older siblings, I was learning English a little bit before I went to high to, uh, school. And it turned out that my uh, kindergarten teacher was Latina which I didn't know that, Mrs. Barrios, because she didn't speak Spanish. But, you know, and then it's just recently that I realized that in my whole career in elementary and high school and, and college and medical school and residency, I never, ever had another Latino teacher. That was the only one my whole career. That's unreal. But, but, they, um, but in that school, um, they did not allow you to speak Spanish because they, they thought that you were talking back. And so if you were caught speaking Spanish in the playground, they would whack you over the head with a ruler and, and go make you stand in the corner because that was not allowed. Wow. So how did that make, did that happen to you? Oh, that happened all the time because, you know, if you're trying to talk to somebody and that's the only language you know. Yeah. Um, and so it made it, made it to where we did not want to speak Spanish anymore. And in fact, for a while there, I lost my Spanish because I just, just suffocated it so much that I thought it was bad to speak Spanish, or to be considered Mexican. So my name became Raymond, not Ramon. Wow, so when did you start um, using Ramon again? My senior year in high school. I started to become more aware of what we were and that to be proud of our heritage and our background, not ashamed. But I was, still, I was still ashamed of my background as a farm worker. So I never talked about that part of my life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's go back into school. Um, so early on, um, you had some heroes in your life, and we're going to cover some heroes in your life and some villains um, in the film. And one of the heroes was Mrs. Lambers. Um, so when you hear that name, what do you think about? I think about this small little Anglo woman. Uh, it, I have no idea how old she was. She was probably in her 20s, but who knows in those days. But. You know, when I went to school, I wore the same clothes to school that I did to work. And we didn't have hot one running water, so we, we stunk. We wouldn't bathe. And, and we'd come straight from the fields to, to school, because I would work in the mornings before, and I would work at, uh, after school. And so, but one day, this Mrs. Lambert, she, she got down to my level, and she said, you should go to college. And why she would say that to a little Mexican boy whose family had just farm workers, I have no idea. But that idea of college made me realize that there might be something out there, whatever that was. So she put that little spark in my, in my mind. So how old were you then? I was in second grade. Mm -hmm. And so you had no idea what college was? I had no clue. <laughs> and she just said, go to college, and I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness she did. <laughs> yes. So now that you're an adult and you're, you're where you're at and you think of her, what do you think of her now? You know, it's interesting because I, I don't remember much about my growing up and the people around me. I mean, in fact, I, a lot of times I have to ask my older relatives about my teachers because I don't remember them. I don't remember their names. I have to ask other people for that. I have to ask about experiences we had because I have a blank, a lot of blanks. And in fact, when I read my memoir, I had to go back and ask people who was our teacher. This, you know, And then it would start slowly coming back to me. Um, but when I, I just think of her as just that one moment in time. I mean, it wasn't like that she did that whole year. It was just a moment in time. And that's why I always think it's so important when I talk to people, I said, you reach a kid at the right time, at the right place, and you just keep trying. Because you never know when the moment will be there. Absolutely. 
Okay, so when you were um, in elementary school and throughout school, um, you, you stuttered badly. And um, I assume that you were teased and it was really horrible for you. Can you talk about that and, uh, and how, how, what happened with that? Well, um, yeah, I especially remember in fourth grade because uh, we had a fourth grade teacher that, um, Mrs. Tobin, I thought she was a witch. You know, she was a person with the wily hair and the hair was out of the mole and the bitty little eyes and she carried a ruler. She was the one who whacked you over the head with a, with a when, she, when you spoke Spanish. But, but um, when I was in class, in her class, and she would call on me and I would stutter, the other kids would laugh at me and so she would whack them over the head. With a ruler, not that. That's great. You know, that, that made me feel good. Um, but it was really hard to try to get through school when you don't speak Spanish very well and they're stuttering. And so, and of course, I was, I had no self esteem, you know, because of what was going on at home. Because at home, there's a lot of abuse going on, a lot of molestations, a lot of alcoholism. I mean, you know, we witnessed people being molested. We witnessed what, you know, spouses getting beat up all the time. We, everybody was drunk all the time. I mean, that was our environment. And so, I just thought that. That's life, and so I thought that's the way I'm going to end up. And so, because of what was going on at home, I just, you know, that made me withdraw and stutter and not want to be very open. And throughout my life, I was very closed off. My friends don't have, didn't have a clue as what was going on in my in my world inside my head. So you've been very closed off your whole life. Yes. Because of that, yeah. Um, understandable. Um, Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the racism and, and discrimination you suffered in, in high school. So um, one of the villains in your life, I would say, is your high school counselor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about that and what happened? Yeah, well, first time I met him is when I went in and, uh, for college prep courses, and the first thing I told him is I want to go to college, and the first thing he told me is you're not smart enough, even though I was the number one student in the elementary school. And he said, well, I'm going to put you in woodshop like I did your brothers. That's where you belong. That's where you people belong. And the implication was just we were not meant for anything but uh, field work. Um, so this man was six foot five, 250 pounds, and um, you know, my grandfather said, you don't talk back to a white man. He can trust your life. He can trust your destiny. He can trust our jobs. But I stood up to him and I said, I really want to go to college. And I think that was a defining moment in my life. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here today. But, you know, it's interesting because you know, when you talk about the discrimination, I mean, we go out and work in the fields and they, um, they refuse to pay us uh, after working. And because they said, you know, what recourse do you have? You know, you can't call the cops because we'll just have you shipped away back to Mexico, even though we were born here. So they were, all, they were always doing that with us. So they'd tell us to pay us $10 a trade to pick grapes. That's how, that's how you got paid. And then at the end of the day, they pay you eight. Um, because you had, as a Mexican in those days, you had no justice, nobody to go complain to. Um, even, even the last time I really ex experienced um, um, discrimination that I've been mean, very vivid is when I opened up my office in Porterville and somebody wrote on my wall, Mexican, go home. They yeah. wrote that before you opened your office, right? Yes. Yeah, they had right. already put some. So you in. had gone to med school and you had done your residency and you were excited to start your practice and right before you opened the, the door, they wrote that, right? Yeah. yeah so that throughout their life, there's, I mean, you know, in high school and college, there's always, and, and you could tell, even in, co in, in elementary school, even though everybody there was poor, it, but if you were Anglo, they looked at you differently. I mean, they gave you the opportunities. I mean, they would tell the, the white kids, okay, now you're, you know, you lead, you lead them because um, they're not leaders. And, and it was just amazing that you, know, you always thought that you had to step behind a white person. Mm -hmm. Even if it was a kid that was, whose parents were working in the fields too. So you grew up feeling inferior? I was inferior. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I cannot remember. Even in medical school, the first, I always thought that everybody else was smarter than I was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in high school, you became very depressed, um, suicidal even. Um, so why, why do you think you got so depressed in high school? I mean, obviously, we know a lot of the adversity we've been talking about, but what specifically in high school do you think contributed 
to the severity of your depression? I think in high school, it was the first time I really saw my situation at home for what it was. It was so dysfunctional and so toxic, and all that stuff that had been going on and all the things that I witnessed. And then when I stepped into the classroom and I saw these kids that were so different from me, and then here I am trying to fit in, and I realized, this isn't me. This isn't where I belong. Um, and you know, and I mean, obviously, I've been depressed my you know, my whole elementary career and life. And um, I was just thinking, you know, I have a pipe dream to be at, you know, to go to college. And nobody in my family had even gone to college or entertained the idea. So I thought that's my own way out, and there's no way I'm going to go. And so I just started thinking about killing myself. That was just um, things that took me so, in my mind. How close did you get to that? Every day I just thought about it. Every day I thought, how am I going to drive off this bridge, or how am I going to find wow. a way to do it? And um, and I would I would leave my friends for weeks at a time and not talk to them. It just function, just go to day, day to day, and um, but. They would, that's the thing, they, I would, they, every time I came back, they would accept me back from who I was and say nothing and ask me no questions. And I think that's saved my life because, and I still have those three friends, they're still friends of mine to this day. Three friends? Yeah. That is amazing. It, I think it really speaks to the power of people being able to find a family or, you know, you were able to find some support that you didn't have anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Okay, so you were the first in your family, I say in quotes, <laughs> um, to go to college, and you knew you wanted to go to college, um, but you weren't quite sure how, and you had no idea what, what really to do. So in high school, you had another hero that came along, um, kind of showed you an opportunity. Um, can you tell us a little, little about Noe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in high school, for some reason, the counselors did not tell us about college, or you know, the most would mention is junior college because you could do carpentry in, in junior college, and you could do plumbing and stuff like that. But um, this one day, this young man showed up, a guy named Noe, and he said, I can tell you how you can go to college, because I'm going to UC Santa Cruz. And so one of these days, I'll show you. I'll, I'll take you there. And um, so one weekend that I wasn't working in the fields, he, he got a group of us together from Redwood High School, and we went. And um, for the first time in my life, I saw the beach, and I saw the ocean, and I saw hope. And I saw this beautiful campus, and I thought, wow, you know, how do I go here? And he said, well, you have to fill out an application, and we need to get your financial records from your parents. Um, so I went back home, and I told my grandparents, I said, wow, I can go to college. I found out a way. My grandmother, too, I looked at me, and she said, you bastard, you're not going anywhere. You got to stay here and get a job as a factory and pay us back for all the time and money we invested in you. I mean, here I supported myself so that since the age of three years of age, and she's telling me that I can't go away to college. So um, I moved out of my home my senior year in order to be able to get away from so her how pressure. So how did that work? How did you move out of your home? Where would you go? <coughs> well, uh, another person, my, my biology teacher, Mr. Nagel, found out my situation. So he found me uh, an apartment near the campus. And you know, I have this, when I tell people, I tell them I, I have had two jobs in my life. I was a farm worker and a doctor. But he also did something else for me. He found me a job as a janitor in uh, my senior year. So I, kept, so I have to change what I tell people because I was a janitor a year and I was proud to do that because that helped me support myself for that whole year. And I just waited for the dream of getting that letter from UC Santa Cruz to see whether I had been accepted or not. Mm -hmm. And so if it wasn't for Mr. Nago, I'm not sure what would happen to me. I'm you know, I, homeless or would have found, I don't know, something else, who knows. But that was a defining, not that defining moment in my life. Somebody stepped up and Absolutely. Me I mean, you definitely have an amazing amount of persistence, but you definitely, definitely also have had angels that have come in at key periods of your life that have helped to make the difference, too. Yes. So. Okay, well then that gets us into college. So you went to UC Santa Cruz in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and at that time the UC system had a, a big um, push in terms of recruiting Latinos um, because the UC system student body um, was vastly underrepresented in terms of uh, Latino students. So you were among that first wave, mm -hmm. and um, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Well, when I first went to the campus and I saw it and I saw, 
I thought it's a park. I mean, it's like, this is a Disneyland for adults because <laughs> in my life it's all farm work and fields. And um, to just step into it and, 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 and to go to the dorm and where people complain about, oh, the dorm being too small and not enough room, I thought, I mean, this is for just two people, not five. <laughs> and the room was bigger than the room we all slept in. And so, and we slept on the floor and all that stuff. So I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And then they, we had to use sheets. And I thought, sheets, what are those? <laughs> I mean, I had no idea how to use sheets. And, and then when we went to the cafeteria and forks and knives, where are the tortillas? I mean, you know, I just mm -hmm. wasn't used to eating that way. It was so foreign to me. I mean, I, honestly, it was just like, it was a different world. I, I just could not believe that I had actually gotten out of my environment and was in a college situation. Did you feel you were in heaven or were you in shock? Or? I was in shock. I was in cultural shock. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had no clue what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I mean, when they, they told me about financial aid and, and I had my grants and my loans and how to get the money and uh, what do you mean how do I get the money? Well, you have to put it in a bank. Well, what's a bank? You have to get a checking account. Well, what's a checking account? I mean, mm -hmm. so I had no clue how to do any of those things. And so I had to learn all that. And so it was just interesting that I kept thinking that every time they charged me a fee for something, because I would overdraw my checks. I had no idea. I thought they were stealing money from me. So, <laughs> so I had to learn all of that. Too. So it was a whole new world in terms of people, too, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, uh, there were a lot of girls around. Yes. <laughs> And uh, so had you dated much uh, until that point? Or? I, I, didn't, I, I didn't date in high school cause again, because of my self-esteem and the, the shame I felt for myself and what was going on inside of me. I was afraid to talk to girls. I just didn't mm. it's, it, interact with them at all. But it was funny because in my first class in college in anthropology, I looked behind me and I see this gorgeous girl. I thought, wow. A couple of days later, I, I actually saw her in the courtyard, and I had the courage to go up to her, and I said, are you Mexican? And she said, no. And I said, that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that I had fallen in love with her, and I was going to marry her. One problem. She had a boyfriend, six foot tall, 200 pounds. His dad was a doctor in Marin County in California, one of the richest areas in the, in the country. And um, so I had to figure out a way to win her back. To, to win her to my side. And uh, here I am, a scrawny Mexican farm worker with long hair and a bandana. And now I'm more or less a militant because I'm realizing the injustices that we're suffering. And um, so I'm competing with this person. And uh, about three months after I met her, she, she came up to my dorm room. And I asked her, what, what are you doing here? She says, I want to just let you know I broke up with Kirk. I said, why did you do that? She says, because I realized I'm in love with you. And that's the first time in my life I had ever heard those words. And we've been married for 41 years. So I did marry her. <laughs> wow, so that was the first time in your life you had heard that. Mm -hmm. And you were, what, 18, 19? 19. Yeah. But even in those days when I started dating her, there was a lot of like, why are you dating? Why is she dating this Mexican? Mm -hmm. you know, so she was getting a lot of static from her. Not so much her family, but her family kept saying, are you sure you know what you're doing? because he doesn't know much about our culture. He doesn't know, he doesn't even know how to use, you know, go out to eat. You know, are you sure you know what you're doing? So they kept asking her and asking her. And they're from Marin County, a very liberal uh, setting in California, but they still kept asking her if she knew what she was doing in an interesting way. Yeah, it is interesting. Your, your backgrounds are so polar opposite. You were from... Uh, Central California in this very poor town, and she was from Marin County, and you found each other, and you chose a very healthy relationship, which is incredible, I think, with your background. Well, it's interesting because, again, I mentioned that Marin County is very liberal, but one of, her, one of their friends, uh, her parents' friends, was applying for medical school at the same time I was, and uh, he didn't get in, and I did, and they were very, very upset because they told her, your, your daughter's boyfriend took our son's spot because he's uh. Mexican. Uh, I mean, this. <laughs> well, um, so speaking of medical school, so when did you decide to, to become a doctor? How, what, what happened? Uh, you know, when I started college, I had no idea what I was going to do. I just thought, I'm in college. And then I thought, well, now what? But you know, my, my, my mother, I mentioned she had five kids before she, um, when she gave us away. But she ended up getting married and had seven more. And her husband, or my stepfather, whatever you want to call him, had an accident in the farm my freshman year at, at college. And he went to the emergency room, 
They told him there's nothing wrong with him. Go back to work. He died of a brain hemorrhage. Um, my Aunt Helen had breast cancer. She went to her, see her doctor. She said, they treated me like dirt because I'm Mexican. I'd rather die. She died. My, my, brother, my brother, Domingo, he was a sickly kid. I was in and out of Valley Children's Hospital in Fresno. He would be in there for six weeks at a time uh, with a GI problem. And um, so I thought, wow, you know, maybe that's what I should do. I should think about going to medical school. So I went up to my advisor, my counselor, and I said, I decided I want to go pre-med. He said, you're not smart enough. He didn't even know who I was. He didn't have his, my transcripts in front of him, but he just looked at the color of my skin and just told me I wasn't smart enough. So I dropped him as my advisor, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so then what'd you do? Well, I asked some people who were pre-med, and I couldn't, in high school I didn't take any of the pre-med classes. I didn't take calculus, physics, or anything like that. And so the first thing I did is I went and signed up for chemistry, and the first thing I did is I flunked it. I thought, wow, that goes that dream. <laughs> but I realized, no, you know, I really want to be a doctor, so I went back and I took it over, and with the help of tutors, I was able to pass all my classes, my physics and my calculus and organic chemistry. And the really interesting thing about that is when my son was at Stanford, he tutored kids that were struggling. Wow. So he, he basically paid it back for me. So your son tutored yeah. others like you had needed tutoring yeah. help. So he helped others get through when people helped me. In so many ways, your, your story goes full circle in terms of being able to see impact like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, med school. So you went to med school in the late 70s at UC Irvine. And um, you got accepted there, you say, because you said something to them when you applied that, that you believe really helped you get in. What was that? Well, in those days, medical schools were you know, only 1% were minority. And they came up with this idea of affirmative action to give some of us an, an opportunity. And again, I didn't have the best MCATs, I didn't have the best grades, but I was able to get an interview. And when I went to UC Irvine, they asked me a question and I said, why do you want to be a doctor? I said, I want to be a doctor so I can go back to my hometown and be a role model for the, for the kids that remind me of the kid I used to be. And I think that's what got me into medical school. Mm -hmm. So what happened when you got there? How, did you feel welcomed or comfortable, or, or what was that? Because you well, said that there weren't many other Latino med students. What happened is that um, one of the Anglo students came up to us. There were a number of other minorities that were admitted. And she said, uh, I, we overheard the, I overheard the professors talking, and they were saying that you people don't belong here, and they got to do everything in, your, in their power to make you guys quit or fail. So that, that was what welcome we had. And we knew that we had our target on our backs, and that if we did not succeed, we would not be able to open up the door for the people to follow us. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was hard. Yeah, you called those your zombie years, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a lot of uh, stress? Very much. Um, I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just going day to day, and I was hoping I just would not fail. Um, it was interesting because when I was thinking about quitting, I get a letter from a, an aunt of mine, Lucinda, and in the letter she said, Raymond, you know, we knew you were smart, and you would get a job indoors, and wear a shirt, suit and tie, but for you to be a doctor, for anybody in our family to be a doctor, that's impossible. So I knew I could not fail my family, because I needed to be a role model for them, too. So things like this kept you going, because I think oftentimes people say, well, you know, what's the key to your perseverance or what, you know, what really ma made you keep going? And I think it changed throughout your life, right? Things like that would keep you going at that right. time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, people talk about having a rock bottom. I know your life is just completely up and down, a, a, lot, of, a lot of challenges. So is there, was there a rock bottom for you? Yes, several. <laughs> but uh, you know, after I was I graduated from medical school, um, I went home um, because they were having a party. But the party wasn't for me; it was for my aunts and sisters. And my family they never got married; they just had babies. Um, and there were two new babies. And so when I was there, I overheard my grandmother and my mother in the background saying, "My son, the doctor's no, he's my son." And I was so angry at them that I went up to them and said, "Neither one of you is my mother." And I went out to Fresno to start my UC, uh, UC San Francisco Fresno to start my internship program. 
And um, while I was there, I was getting really severe headaches from the tension. I mean, you know, kids were dying, and I wasn't used to all these kids dying on us. But about a month after I started my program, I get a call from home. My sister Annette was married to an abusive alcoholic man, just, just like every single woman in my family. And she decided she had enough. She left him. Unfortunately, she left him to go to my brother Danny's house. And this man followed her there. Danny tried to stop him at the door. He pulled out a gun, shot Danny, and killed him in front of his two kids. Tracked the neck down into the bedroom, shot her, and killed her in front of her two kids, and took off to Mexico, never to be seen again. They, were good. they gave me two, two days off from my internship to go home for the funerals. And when I was home, I realized that in my selfishness to make something of myself, I had abandoned my own family. I wasn't there for them. So I went back to my internship program, and I quit. I just said, I can't take this anymore, so I quit. I can't imagine, I mean, you know, the family, family violence like that and the family guilt that you had on top of it. Um, so how did, you, how did you rebound from that? You went back, and then how in the world would you get back on track after all that torment? Um, my wife was pregnant, and my daughter was born. And when I held her in my arms, and she looked up at me, I realized this was no longer about me. This was what I could do for her. So I went back, and I begged for my job back. And they gave me my job back. And every time I wanted to quit or failed, I just had to hold my little girl in my arms. I said, this is for you. And it, I still call her my little lifesaver. Because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have finished up. So she was your lifesaver. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the number of it, the amount and the different kinds of adversity you've had, the hunger and the abuse and the discrimination and just the wide range of things you had been through. Um, what do you think you would say is, has been the hardest throughout your life? I, I think my, my low self-esteem has always bothered been a burden from the get-go. And even through medical school, I was thought I was the stupidest, dumbest student. And in residency, I always thought I was, a, a, you know, I was a, again, the back of the pack. And even when I graduated and I started my practice, I thought every other doctor in town was smarter than I was. Um, and I, I joined Rotary. I don't know if anybody knows what Rotary is, but I joined Rotary, and I became the president after being only in the club for three years. And I thought, what am I doing here? I'm, I don't know enough to even run a, a club, much less um, be in front of them like this. Um, but the hardest part is I was thinking that I never was good enough. I never was smart enough. Um, and I think once I told my story in front of my, my Rotary Club, and they accepted me, because I never told people about my life before. That changed me, because I realized I had value. But being a farm worker wasn't the end of the world. It was something that I used to springboard myself ahead. And if I could just share all the stuff that went in my life with other people, and I could make them realize that if they suffered the abuse or they had no mother or father or this was going on, that they could make it too. That is so powerful because I feel like um, we all have pain. We, we have different kinds of pain and struggle, but um, we tend to hold it in, you know, and maybe move on or ignore it or, or not talk about it because we're ashamed. And you're speaking to the power of sharing it. And whether it's in your Rotary Club or with a friend or a family member or therapist or whoever it may be, and it kind of takes the power away of the, yes, of the pain. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so your ticket out was education. Right. Obviously. And um, so do you view education as a human right? Or what's your philosophy about education? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think it's ridiculous when I have kids in my practice who say they can't go to college because they can't afford it. And I'm talking about, I don't, you know, Mexican, Anglo. I mean. It's sad that they have to make a choice. And in this world, if you want to go to college and you're qualified, you should be able to go to college. I just think it's criminal that when people get out of college, they owe so much money. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. 
How much did you pay for your kids' uh, educations? My daughter was 25000 a year, so it was 100000 and luckily she didn't go out fifth year. <laughs> <laughs> um, my son was 200000 at Stanford, but I did not pay for medical school. I figured he could pay him his own medical school expenses. <laughs> So that's a sizable bill that you could do because you were a doctor and you achieved the American dream, but uh, that's a crazy amount of money to think about. Yes, it's, it's I, I honestly don't see how if somebody can go and come into, the, into a job owing 100,000 or 150,000 as a teacher or whatever else, and you know, I mean, it takes 20, I mean, it took me 20 years, even though most of my, lo uh, my college and medical school were based on loans and grants. I finished paying out my college loans the year before my daughter started college. So I've been paying college for a lot of years. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I was blessed to be able to do that mm -hmm. because of the education I received. And I think most parents want that. They want to be able to do that. So it's just this issue of is education affordable and accessible? Um, okay, so now I'd like to ask you some fun questions, <laughs> and then um, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, and what we're thinking of there, just so you can kind of noodle on it, is um, we want you to think about uh, Dr. Ressa's life and his story and maybe the elements of it that really touched you and why the story resonates with you. So, okay, so first of all, you are a good golfer. <laughs> so you are, a, what, a handicap seven or something? Nine. I'm not that good. OK. Well, that's pretty good as far as I understand. I think my practice gets in my way of my practicing for golf. <laughs> OK. Right, you took a red eye here because you wanted to play golf. One more time with my son. Right. My son was home, and we played seven rounds of golf in eight days. Right. <laughs> OK, but I hear you get frustrated on the golf course. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So what would be an embarrassing golf blow-up that you had? Well, I don't think it's embarrassing. Just the fact that I throw my clubs and hit the trees and they break. That's not <laughs> embarrassing. That's just something I do because then I get angry. OK, <laughs> not frustrated. embarrassing to you. OK. No. <laughs> All right. And um, so you're a pediatrician. And parents ask you all the time, well, what do I do if little Joey doesn't want to eat his vegetables? And what do you say? I tell him I hate vegetables. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> I said, but somehow my, both my kids love vegetables. And so I just tell them, you know, don't push it. Um, but do what my wife does. Mince it really, really fine. And that way, I can't pick it out. Because if I can pick out the vegetables, I don't care how small they are, I will pick them up. <laughs> so if she minces it, so I tell them to mince it. Very to, this, to this day? Yes, to this day. <laughs> OK. Yeah, yeah, to this day. Um, when you hear the word cadaver, what do you think? Oh, I just think of being in an anatomy lab, uh, dissecting the cadaver while I'm having a sandwich and hoping that I don't mix the two up. <laughs> <laughs> What's your definition of happiness? Babies, kids, holding a baby. That's my all-time favorite. Just after I examine a four or five-month-old baby, and after I get done, I just hold them. It's just so neat to just hold them and have them look at you and smile and go go gurgle and you know, make little noises. That's it. That's my. You live for babies. I, I live for babies, and that's my biggest gripe about my kids, jerks. They will not give me grandchildren yet. <laughs> They're 34, no, 35 and 30, and you think by this time. My, my older brother, my, he's only older by, um, um, than me by two years. He already has great grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll think good thoughts for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, what's the most uh, disappointing part of your life right now? What's really kind of just bugging you lately these days? Uh, Trump, politics, what's going on in this world, in this country. Uh, really, that's it. I just think that um, it's going to have a lot of effect on a lot of people, like migrant education programs, like programs that benefit kids that they may cut out because they're going to think, oh, well, 50 million here or 100 million here, no big deal. They don't understand that in my community, it's going to impact those schools and those children so much. And what about your peer group and things that you've been seeing lately or hearing? And Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends who are in Rotary and are Anglo and are conservative and are Republican. And we get along really well. 
and I, unfortunately, I've been hearing a lot of more racist remarks from them than I used to. So they've been given permission to open up about their racism that I thought didn't exist anymore. And they probably don't realize it in front of you, right? I mean, they're friends with you. Well, they say, oh, yeah, but you're different. You're an exception. You're a doctor. You know, you're not, you know, like, well, that makes a difference. <laughs> mm hmm No, that's, um, that must be really jarring to, to see that in people that you know coming yeah, out. Yeah, it's, it's sad because I thought this world was changing. Um, okay, and then before we get to the Q&A, one more. So if you could talk to your 18-year-old self, what would you say? Honestly, I have no idea what I would say because I, I can't even fathom I mean, what, an eight, what I was as an 18-year-old other than I was lost. And I just, I mean, I just had hope about going to college. I, I have no idea, honestly, what I could have said to myself. Well, maybe you could say something like, hang on, because you'll be good. <laughs> Who knows? I, 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 I don't speculate. I mean, like I said, I'd, my, somebody asked me one time, what, what, would you, what would you tell your father if you ever met him? I have no idea. I mean, I don't even speculate about what happened to my father or where he is or what he's done. I don't think about it. OK. Great. Um, well, can we open up for a Q&A? OK. <laughs> Uh, who's first? <laughs> that was a very powerful presentation. Thank you so much for being so honest and sharing your emotion. Um, you talked a lot about not knowing your father, but what about your mother? What kind of relationship did you have with her, especially after she married and had seven additional children? Was she a factor in your life? My mother was my aunt. I always thought of her as my aunt. Never thought of her as my mother. I thought of my brother's half-brothers and sisters is just more siblings. I thought of my grandparents' kids, my aunts and uncles, as more as my brothers and sisters. But even that was kind of like older than I was. So it was like I was in limbo. I wasn't sure where, to, where I belonged. But my, my mother lived at the same time I did, but she didn't really exist to me other than in, but you there. would run into her and? It, 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 yeah, family get-togethers and maybe or on the street, but I again, just didn't, didn't relate to her. Um, thank you uh, so much for your time and for your talk. Um, so, so obviously, like, your legacy is going to go far beyond the beginning of, of, of growing up without your paternal, like, mom, mother and father. But, like, personally, like, I have family members who've been abandoned. So I, I even see, like, firsthand, like, how difficult it would be for anyone. Um, and so like through your talk, you just like radiate that you moved beyond like the bitterness and like the hurt. So, so I guess like what helped you heal uh, beyond the hurt? I think that when somebody asked me to write a book about my life experiences, I was able to get that out and open it up and, and actually see what all the stuff that happened. And it was, and also that before my mother, I mean, I hated my grandparents for what they did to us. But before they died, I realized that they themselves had no education. They had no hope. They were just struggling to survive. And so I was able to forgive them for that. And the same thing with my mother. I mean, she had five kids before she was 21. I mean, she was molested, <laughs> plain and simple. She didn't know what she was doing either, so I shouldn't have blamed her either. And so I was able to forgive her. And before she died, I took her to a restaurant, the best restaurant that she had ever been to in her life. Just kind of take her out. And two weeks later, she died. So I had some peace, because I didn't walk away with bitterness. Um, uh, thank you for the very uh, powerful story. Um, um, I think, I think a lot of people would call your experience like the definition of the American dream. Um, I want to ask you if, if what, your definition of the, what your definition of the American dream is and, um, and if, if, you, if you think it, the American dream is still alive and has a future. Yes, it is still alive. I think that the current administration is stepping on it on a lot of cases. But I think you still are able to make it in this world if you try and if you have support. And if somebody's behind you. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have been like if I had some family support behind me or parents. I have no idea what I would have done. 
But I think that's an important thing, and I tell all my parents in my office and that I encounter, just be there and be supportive, no matter what it is that your kids want to do. I had one young, one young man that was sent to me by the judge because he was getting into trouble. And um, he, didn't want to go, he didn't want to go to school because he didn't like it. Um, and he was hijacking cars and getting into trouble. But anyway, so he came in, and um, he, I asked him one time, I said, why are you doing this? He says, because I don't like my life. He said, well, what do you want to do with your life? He says, I want to be a cook. I want to go to culinary school. And I said, well, why don't you do that? I can. So yes. Well, my parents don't want me to be a cook. He said, so what cares what your parents want? What do you want? So he had an adult, a person of authority, tell him, do what you want. All of a sudden, his eyes lit up. And that's really what it is. I, I just, you just do what's fun. And I think if, as long as you do what's fun, you are to live the American dream. I happen to be a doctor, a pediatrician, and I love being around babies, so I am I'm right where I should be. I, and I, in fact, I should be working right now, and I can't wait to get back to work so I can play with babies again. <laughs> and I would tell parents that, you know, you're paying me to do this? This is great. Mm -hmm. a great job. <clears throat> I have a question for Diane. Um, I'm curious to know, as one of the documentary makers of Ramon Rising, how you came across Dr. Race's story and sort of how you went about putting that together and what the status is now. Mm. Thanks, yeah. Well, it's an incredible opportunity and blessing to be able to be making this film because it's such an important story. And um, how we came about it is uh, my husband, Jesse, was uh, a media consultant after spending many years in TV news. And he, during that time, he was advising people about how to gain national news exposure and so forth. And on a panel at the National Speakers Foundation. And Ramon was there. Um, he was writing his book, his memoir, at the time. And Ramon asked um, Jesse about the title, Farm Worker to Pediatrician. And Jesse knew at that instant, that was over 10 years ago, Jesse knew that that was just the story. And long and short, um, we decided to make our first documentary project together um, with Ramon's story because it's it goes without saying, it's the perfect story. Um, so we're in production right now, and um, we've shot probably 25% of it, maybe 30%. And we have a little, few more weeks of shooting and a few months of editing. Um, so we're hoping to get it out as soon as possible, because it goes without saying, I think, but the movie needs to be out there for many reasons. Thank you for sharing your story, Dr. Reza. Uh, Diane pointed out in the Q&A with you uh, that you had some well-placed angels throughout your life. So what sparks you, what do you do to pay it forward? I talk to a lot of schools, a lot of third graders, fourth graders, high school, college, uh, kids in trouble, kids who are losing their way. Um, in my office, I talk to the kids. If they don't perform, I tell them off. That you're smart. Don't you dare tell me that you're only capable of doing a C. So I become their role model, their authority. If when their parents are happy, no, just happy with them getting a C, I said I wouldn't be happy with that. So I push them, um, and I push other people. When I meet other people and I talk to other people, I tell them this is all you have to do to to make this kid a success. Just be there. Just be there for that one moment. Um, I don't like to talk. I don't like to go all over the country, all over the state. But that's what I do. And I do it because um, this young woman not too long ago, I told my story and she said, I had given up hope. And I heard your story. Now I have hope. So I realized that even though I don't want to do this anymore, there are other people that will benefit from it. So I keep going. Yeah, so you mentioned you didn't want your kids to suffer the same way that you did growing up. Um, so what did you do to prepare your own kids um, against uh, discrimination? Against what? Uh, discrimination. Basically, uh, just being a doctor <laughs> and living in a home with a swimming pool and not out in the ghettos or not in, out in a toxic environment like I did or the neighborhood was a lot of it. 
not, show, not letting them be exposed to it. I mean, my kids were not exposed to my family. They were not exposed, uh, exposed to the abuse and the um, alcoholism. They were not exposed to the negativity that's going on there. It was all about positive, positive, positive role models. And I was showing them, I mean, every time we went somewhere, I showed them colleges. We go to you know, Santa Cruz, go to San Francisco, USC, Cornell, Harvard, Yale. We, every time we went on a trip, we'd stop by the schools and look at them. And that was just, my whole point was, Oh, now you're going to college. The question is where, not are you going to college. And that's how I just brought them up, that they, they had the opportunity and the ability to do anything they wanted to. I never pushed them. I just expected it of them. And they met my expectations. You shielded them, though, from, from I, a lot. From I, I, they, even, I mean, my son heard my talk at Stanford one time, and I asked my wife, said, well, what did he think? He said, he was so mad at you. Why? Because you had never told him any of this stuff before. So I, I did not bring my background into their world. So they grew up in a middle class world that had all the opportunity open to them.